Good afternoon, everyone. <clears throat> this is the Bishop's Desk. Uh, we were down last week. We had some technical difficulties dealing with uh, Comcast and some streaming issues. But we're back this week with the Bishop's Desk in Hebrews. Uh, give you a minute to get your Bible um, and turn your Bibles to the book of Hebrews. Um, yeah, we'll be in Hebrews again. Hebrews being a a long book to pretty much cover thirteen chapters. So what I intend to do is kind of like gloss over every chapter and pull out a lot of the main points and try to get a understanding of each chapter in the book of Hebrews. Um, again, the writer is the apostle Paul, maybe Barnabas, maybe Luke, but it was accredited to Paul because of the language in it. Um, as you see, I am representing the bishops that's here on my t-shirt here and prayerfully one day, the Bishop Dust T-shirt will be up for sale. You will be able to purchase a T-shirt um, and promote the Bishop's Dust. All proceeds will go to Maranatha Christian School. Maranatha Christian School right now is in a transition state. Um, a lot of people don't realize what we offer here at Maranatha. I think <clears throat> I may have to reapproach the way that I market Maranatha because, <clears throat> excuse me, Maranatha was formed and created to educate young children from the grades of kindergarten, I believe pre-K, up until the fifth grade. Affordable. Our tuition here at Maranatha for the entire school year is 54, five, $5,500, which is very, very competitive um, and affordable. Maranatha offers uh, a great challenging curriculum to its students the Alpha and Omega curriculum if you get a chance and you have a child you can go and research the Alpha and Omega curriculum I will be putting out um, some some footage on on one of our students and how she has progressed so much from the curriculum uh, to show parents um, the potential that their child could reach uh, through our school and our teaching here at Maranatha. So you will see a lot of postings and information about Maranatha because um, I need to get it out because it, it'll be a blessing to so many children and I know it will because it's a private school. Classroom size is no more than 16 children in a class, uh, which makes your classroom super competitive, um, very hands-on. Um, it will allow the teacher, the instructor, to deal with children who are having issues and you don't have to speak like you're speaking in a lecture hall to everybody and you don't have the time to address uh, the child and the child's needs. Um, we, we wanted to keep all of that in-house because we understand how the, the American family now, and it is so busy. It is it's such a demand on parents to go to work to feed the family and then to try to come home and meet the child's needs 
in school. So we tried to address all of that to make it easier on the parent at home. So we didn't give a lot of homework. We did a lot of the work right here in school because we understand even a lot of parents now, you know, suffer with uh, education deficiencies and the older you get, you forget a lot of these things. When you were young, you may have you may were uh, you may have been very good in math and and social studies and science, but the older you get, some of these things you forget uh, the the foundation of these these learnings, and you forget how to uh, get to certain answers in math because of the foundation that you must know to get to an answer. And so we, we didn't send home a lot of homework so that children wouldn't be uh, home and suffering because the parent maybe didn't know how to help the child. So we tried to do all of that here. And I really believe that so many people are missing the gym that's here at CCOC at Maranatha. Um, but I'm going to be doing some, some, some remarketing strategies and I'm going to try to get Maranatha out into the public and the, the into the community more so that the children can benefit from what we're offering here at Maranatha we, and we also along with their education and along with their their books and their studies we're, we're teaching them salvation in Christ Jesus we're, we're teaching them that Christ Jesus the Son of God uh, God the Father the Trinity teaching them how to pray, to pray with them. All of the things that a child need to develop, to become um, a mature adult and, 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 and one that a parent would be proud of. And so we're trying to prepare them to go into middle school. And so um, we have a computer lab here that I'm working on tirelessly to get up and running for our children because we understand that the world has evolved and the world um, has moved to technology and technology rule and it rained now. And so we want our children to be uh, technical savvy, to be able to turn on a computer and know how to navigate through a computer because a lot of times when you go to job interviews now, interviews and applications are online. And that right there alone keeps a lot of people from applying for work. You, you wonder why a lot of people may not even go for a job interview because the old traditional way of getting up, putting your necktie on and going into the, uh, uh, the office and having a face-to-face -face interview, that's gone away. You gotta go online and you have to download this, you have to download that, you have to have this, you have to have that. Poor people don't have those things. Some poor people never even had a computer in their home. And so that, that eliminate you right there from being able to apply for a job in some instances. McDonald's, uh, Royal Farm, 7-Eleven, all these things, these places you go and you see apply online. And so we want our children to be able to, wherever their life go, to be able to apply um, online if need be to be able to use the computer correctly and so um, with I really believe in my spirit that a lot of people would like to send their children to private school but they can't afford it and so I'm looking for different strategies and different uh, outlets that maybe would sow financially into a child's education for four years that would be that that while they're here, that would be twenty five thousand dollars for five years. Man. You 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 can't get that. I my I sent I sent Ahmad and Jeremiah to private school and and I paid twenty thousand dollars a year for them to go to school. Uh between tuition and the fees and their lunch every day and their clothes. It cost me twenty thousand dollars a year. And so I don't want to. I don't want to uh, 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 put that number out, which is so 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 far to reach and obtain. But we brought that number down to five thousand four hundred dollars a year. 
is very attainable. I tried to keep it. I thought about aftercare. And I said, you know, rather than taking a child to daycare, to bring them to school. You know, bring them to school. And the money you would pay in daycare, pay it for them to be in school. And so, uh, yeah, any proceed that you see from the bishop's desk, it will go to uh, Maranatha. So when you see, go to the church website real soon, you'll be able to see a link there where you can purchase uh, the bishop's desk. And, and there'll be other uh, links where you can purchase it. The t-shirt probably won't cost you but $20. You know, I'm just not into overcharging people. I'm not into robbing God's people. I'm not into trying to fleece God's people. I'm not into trying to squeeze God's people for money because I understand that we live in a tight time and I understand that so many people struggle financially. But you know, if you can sow a small seed into a child's education, most of us can afford that, whatever it is. Just sow it. You know, and 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 God will bless you. And I and again, I always thank those who who sow consistently, whether it's twenty, whether it's a hundred, whether it's two hundred dollars, three hundred dollars into Maranatha. I appreciate you. All right. So uh, again, Hebrews. We talked last week. Hebrews chapter one. And we, we, we spoke in Hebrews about Jesus Christ being a better hero than Moses. We know that Moses was, was somewhat of a hero to Israel. But, but Jesus was a far more better hero than Moses. Um... Jesus a better priest we know that Aaron and his sons was chosen to be the priest over the house and it was their responsibility to handle the, the holy sacraments uh, of the house of the temple and no one else had been set apart for this but Aaron and his sons but we find here Jesus a better priest than Aaron and his sons. We know the story on Aaron and how he failed greatly when Moses was with God and they convinced Aaron to make them a God. This is why the word let us know that Jesus was a better priest because you look at Aaron, right? Moses was with the people, was with God, getting knowledge and instructions. And the people wanted to know where Moses was. They knew he was with God. And they were saying to Aaron, we need a God right now. Moses is gone. We can't find him. Paraphrasing. We need you to make us a God right now. And they put so much pressure on Aaron. That Aaron said, okay. Gather all of your earrings, your, your gold rings, your gold chain, and all of the gold things that you have and bring them to me. They melted the gold down and Aaron made a false god for them to worship. And he paid a great price for that. And it's almost like pastors today. People want you to cater to their personal needs. People want you to run the church the way they want you to run the church. People want you to preach the word that they like hearing the way they like hearing it. People want you to have all the functions in the church, the, the boards, all these things in the house of God. They want you to do it the way 
that they want you to do it. People don't even understand when they go to the pastor and start telling the pastor what to do, how to do it, when to do it. I like this. I like that. You can't preach this. You can't preach that. If it's the word of God, then the pastor should preach it. He shouldn't add anything to it. He shouldn't take anything away from it. And people don't understand the pressure that they put on pastors. And they try, and in so many ways, they try to usurp God. Forgetting that God said that I will send you pastors after my own heart. What did God mean when he said that? I'll send you a pastor that's going to be honest before you. I'll send you a pastor that's going to live holy before you. I'll send you a pastor that 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 will that will pray for you. I'll send you a pastor that will intercede on your behalf. I'll send you a pastor that will give you knowledge and give you understanding and give you counsel when you need it. I'll send you a pastor that I will speak to and give him direction or give her direction to lead you. But oftentimes pastors, they allow the people to persuade them. And then they get in trouble with God. Well, spoiler alert. I'll listen, I truly will listen. I'll hear you, I'll truly hear you. But I'm gonna do what God say. I'll do what God say. I'm not gonna do what I feel. I'm not gonna be like Aaron, I'm not. I'm not going to allow anybody to get close to me and persuade me to do anything. I have to be obedient unto God. And this is what happened here with Aaron. This is what happened with Moses. God gave Moses a, a simple instruction. He said, Moses, speak to the rock. And God was going to do the rest. Moses, out of his frustration, he went, took his staff, and he struck the rock. God held, God held on his promise, though. God said, when you speak to the rock, Moses, that the water will come flowing out of the rock. But Moses hit the rock, and the water still came flowing out of the rock. But because of Moses, because God was still going to bless his people, not God, not, not because of Moses' disobedient wasn't going to stop God from being true to his word. But it cost Moses. And as great as Moses was, I don't want to make the mistake that Moses made. And I refuse to. By getting angry at God's people, I'm not going to get angry at you. I'm going to try my best not to be angry with you. One, because I understand that if I'm angry with you, it is grievous unto you. And two, if I'm angry with you, I understand that anger will cause you to, to deal in your flesh. Anger comes out of the flesh. And as long as you're in your flesh, you can't hear God. And so as a leader, as a pastor, I'm not going to be angry with you because I need to hear God on so many different levels. I don't only need to hear God for you, but I need to hear God for myself. And so I'm not going to allow myself to get angry with you. And then I don't hear from God for me and you. So we find here in Hebrews. We talked. And Hebrews, as the writer writes. Uh, I'm here in my study book, uh, the complete Bible, okay? This writer here 
said that scholars reading between the lines also guess that some of these Jewish Christians are giving up on Christianity and going back to their old time religion. The scholars speculate that it's because of the increasing persecution Christians are facing. And so you even see how today people are leaving the church because of persecution. Not, not the type of persecution that the church was experiencing during this time where uh, the church had become, they were making the church like sport. They were putting them in arenas and they were letting the lions and the, and the animals, uh, people fight with these, 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 these wild beasts and they destroyed the people and they found that to be sport. But the persecution that the church is facing today is our minds is presenting so much warfare because we're seeing so many different things and a lot of people in the church are following so many different things and, and, and a lot of times don't even realize that some of the things that you follow are being driven from unclean spirits. A lot of things that you see that look good isn't always good. And this is persecution because it's causing you to walk away from God. It's causing you not to fulfill your responsibility, your works as a child of God that, that you're required to fulfill. And so we find here in Hebrews, as I went through um, one and three, I believe, again, I'll, I'll, I'll give you history. It's anonymous, ascribed to Paul, Barnabas, and Luke we, we, in Apollos. But its opinion seemed to favor Paul. Okay? It's apparently written primarily to Hebrew Christians and you and me. These converts were consistent danger of relapsing into Judaism. Old time religion. Uh, the key word is to do better. But the letter also shows the chief doctrinal purpose of the writer. He was showing the transcendent glory, the change of, of the Christian dispensation as compared with that of the Old Testament, right? So here in Hebrews, you'll see how things begin to change where there was no more use for the religion of Judaism. There was no more use for the use of animal sacrifice. The book begins to exalt Christ as the ultimate sacrifice. It begins to, the writer begins to speak about Christ and how God was pleased with Christ being the ultimate sacrifice. And that Christ would become that sacrifice for man unto, back unto God. And so we see in chapter 1, as I read last week, week before last, it said, God, who has sun dry times and in divers manners, spake in time past unto the fathers by prophets. We talked about the major and the minor prophets, how God used the prophets. Prophets were men and women that spoke on behalf of God. You're today's preachers. Okay? have in these last days spoken unto us by his son. He's no, he no longer used the prophets to come and speak to a nation. But he sent Jesus Christ, being the word of God, to speak now to the nations, to his people.
whom he have appointed heir of all things. He has put all things, God, who in the Old Testament was operating and in control of all things. He has put all of his control in Christ Jesus for this appointed time. By whom also he made the worlds. Who being the brightness of his glory. Who? Jesus Christ. Being the, bright, being the brightness of his God. Glory. Because the glory belongs to God. But Jesus Christ became the brightness of that glory. He became the express image of that brightness. Of that glory. So you say. What does God's glory look like? The expressed image of Jesus Christ is what it looks like. God's glory looks like Jesus Christ. Because he said, and the express image of his person. The point and the time before God spoke Christ Jesus into existence. Christ was in God. In the spirit. God the Father, Jesus Christ the Son, and the Holy Ghost, they were all one spirit. Jesus Christ was a spirit at one point in God. The Holy Ghost is the spirit, even unto now, in God. God is a spirit. But when man sinned against God and God would no longer accept man's polluted sacrifice, God said that I will speak my own perfect sacrifice into existence. And when he, ex when he spoke the brightness of his glory, the expressed image that came into a person was Jesus. And upholding all things by the word of his power. When he had by himself purged our sins. This is why Jesus Christ is called today the only begotten of the Father. Because he was the only one by himself that God expressed and spoke into existence there was no one else this is why god the father has 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 given him and appointed all things unto him because he's he's all by himself if there had been another then we would have to pay homage to another one beside jesus but there is none other than Jesus, but Jesus. There's nobody else that went to the cross for you and I, but Jesus. The express image of God's glory. Amen? And then he sat down on the right hand of the majesty on high. That seat. No other person would be worthy to sit into it. Why? And it's because when he had by himself purged our sins, made him worthy to sit in that seat that God had created at the right side of his throne, Christ became worthy. Being made so much better than the angels as he had by inheritance obtained a more excellent name than they. This takes us back to Colossians, preeminence. My Bible on the left hand side is preeminence of Christ, right? We looked at that word preeminence before meaning before all. Having the first, right? Preeminence. Christ has the first of all 
things pertaining to God. Being made so much better, the Bible say, than angels. What are angels? They are beings. They are living beings. Living spirits. That move only when God speaks to them. The angels in heaven are still under subjection. You and I have more power than angels, but we can't move like angels. Angels don't have the, the, the opportunity to make a choice like you and I do. Because angels are in heaven waiting on the instructions. from God and so they are there the angels are there in heaven waiting to move spirits waiting to be commanded and commissioned to operate this is why God told man not to Partake of the tree of knowledge Because once we Took part of the tree of knowledge We gained the knowledge that God Wanted to keep for himself God wanted to To be in control of our existence Because he understood that As long as he was in control of our existence We would be okay But because of sin because of, but because of that spirit of deception, deceitfulness, that spirit of manipulation, that spirit of cunningness, that spirit of convincing, that same spirit that fell on Adam, that fell all the way down to Aaron and his sons and convinced Aaron to make a, 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 a golden image to worship is the same image that we fight against today. It's the same spirit that we fight against today. Not image, but spirit. But talking about Jesus here, being so much better than the angels, none of the angels have been found worthy to sit in that seat of majesty. I can even imagine the angels there wondering how great Jesus is. The angels being there, being obedient unto the voice of God. Just like you, if you're being obedient unto the voice of God, wouldn't you feel worthy? Wouldn't you feel like you want to be in that space with God? But God said, no, only my son is worthy. Because only my son was obedient unto the end. What are you talking about? When Jesus Christ was on the cross. When Jesus Christ asked the father, if it be thy will, would you have this cup passed from me? And God didn't speak. But Jesus Christ not being able to sin. He didn't call a legion of angels to come and get him. The same angels that's there because Jesus is God. The same angels that's there waiting on God to speak. Jesus Christ on the cross could have called those same angels. And said come rescue me. But because he understood the divine nature of his father in heaven. He wouldn't fall out of line. Because he understood. What was happening. That his death. Would adopt sons and daughters. And he being made so much better than the angels and have. In verse four and. 
he had by inheritance, he inherited this, obtained a more excellent name than they. Why? Because he was obedient and he came into the earth and he died. He paid the ultimate price. He obtained that more excellent name. All of the angels have names. We don't know their names. God has spoken. He's told us about the archangel Michael. He told us his name. But Jesus Christ, his name is more excellent than any of the names of the angels. Verse 4. For unto which of the angels said he at any time, thou art my son. There's no verse from Genesis to Revelation that you'll see where God spoke to any of the angels and addressed them as his son. Only Jesus, the first begotten. Thou art my son in whom I am well pleased. During his baptism, when he was filled with the Holy Ghost, we had a conversation about that. Was Jesus filled with the Holy Ghost? Jesus was the Holy Ghost. Jesus is the Holy Ghost. There's no doubt. But because of the process that Jesus came to show man that he must complete here in this tabernacle, Jesus himself, God the Father, Jesus, the, Jesus God, God Jesus, they decided that when Christ would come that he would not be full of the Holy Ghost in that body of flesh until John baptized him. The Bible said that when John baptized Jesus, John began to speak the same way we speak. This is the Holy Ghost. This is the begotten of the Father. This is the Messiah. This is he, John was speaking the way we the way we speak, right? He is the Holy Ghost. He's going to he's going to baptize you with with fire. I'm not worthy to baptize him. John thought the way that we thought, and that's why Jesus told John, John, listen, you and I have been sent. To fulfill the word of God. So you have to baptize me John. I must be filled with the Holy Ghost. Because John was thinking like us. This is the Holy Ghost. Because after he baptized Jesus. The Bible says that. That a dove descended. Set upon him. And he was filled with the Holy Ghost. This is the word of God. And God said, this is my son. He made a proclamation that this is my son in whom I am well pleased. God was saying, I am well pleased of what he has done up until this point. He's been obedient up until this point. I'm well pleased. He allowed John to baptize him. Why? Because this is what I intended to happen. This is my son. And I'm well pleased with him. And so, not any other angel God spoke to. The Bible said, this is a divine witness. This day have I begotten thee. And again, I will be to him, talking about Jesus, a father. And he shall be to me a son. Verse 6, and again, when he bringeth in the first begotten into the world, he saith, and let all the angels of God worship him. Christ being worshipped as the only begotten of the Father. His name being a wonderful name. 
a mighty counselor. We see in verse, let's go to verse uh, chapter 3 of Hebrews, verse 3. It says, chapter 3, verse 3 in Hebrews. For this man was counted worthy of more glory than Moses. And as much as he who had built the house have more honor than the house. Oftentimes we, 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 we look at the finished product and we gloat over the finished product. But what about the one who built the house? They deserve credit too. Because had not they built the house, it would be nothing there for you to gloat over. Jesus was counted more worthy than Moses. Why? Because Jesus Christ built this foundation that we, that we stand on. Jesus Christ built it and he's more worthy. Again, the preeminence of Christ. Let's look at Revelation 19 and 12. Revelation, Revelation 19 and 12. Revelation 19 and 12. As a matter of fact, what I'm going to do, I, I, I'm not going to, because I can't spend too much time here. Let's read, let's read this, this entire chapter of Revelation 19. Let's look at it. I don't have time to go into it, but let's just look at it. I want to I want to pull this one word up real quick. A, see if I can get a meaning. A L L E L U I A. Pull that word up if you have a device. Uh, to A L L. E L U I A. I got a meaning here. Let me see. Ah. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Okay. But it gives us H, but this doesn't say H. It says A L L E L U I A. But then when you hit the meaning, it goes straight to. Hallelujah. H A L L E U J A H. Hallelujah. 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 Okay? So this must be the correct, the Arabic, uh, the Hebrew uh, pronunciation of how to spell hallelujah. The. The way we spell it is H A L L E L U J A H. It comes here A L L E U A L L E L U I A. Okay? We understand. Hallelujah. The highest praise unto God. We know that, right? It's a praise. God be praised. He is risen. Hallelujah. Okay. Chapter 19. And after these things, I heard a great voice of much people in heaven. This let us know. This was John on the Isle of Patmos. That there, there's activity. There's life going on in heaven. Saying, hallelujah. Salvation and glory and honor and power unto the Lord our God. They were giving thanks. They were giving praise. Because they were able to see what God was doing and had done. For true and righteous are his judgments. For he had judged the great whore. Talking about the nations that had whored against God. When God talks about the whore, he's talking about the nations who have, who have gone against him. He, he addressed Israel as a whore. Because he was in covenant relationship with Israel. And Israel constantly went against God. Constantly complained to him. Constantly.
constantly mingled and, and, and made covenants with other nations. Constantly desired to be like other people and stood before God as a whore. A, 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 a woman who, who has no regards of her body. A woman who will sell her body for, 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 for funds, for cash, for money. A whore. For merchandise, she'll sell herself. And this is what Israel had done. And, and, and God was, he was upset about this. And they saw this. John saw this in this vision. The judgments of God. For he had judged the great whore, which did corrupt the earth with her fornication, and have avenged the blood of his servants and her hand. She had done a lot of bad things. And again they say, hallelujah. And her smoke rose up forever and ever. And the four and twenty, and the four and twenty elders, and the four beasts fell down and worshiped God. That sat on the throne saying, Amen, Hallelujah. They were in agreements. The four, the 24 elders which are there, and those four beasts that Ezekiel prophesied about. You know, for Ezekiel prophesied in chapter one about the four beasts that he saw. The one with the uh head of a lion, uh, one had the head of an eagle, one had the head of a man, and the other one was the eagle, the lion, the eagle, the lion, the man, eagle, lion, man. Man, lion on the side, ox. On the left, and the eagle, the ox, which works. We know the ox is there to work. The eagle, he's above. He flies above. He get away. Untouchable. The man, his knowledge, representing the image of God. The lion, the king, the, the, the one who will devour. He's, 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 he's the head of all the beasts. Okay? So this was the representation. And, 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 and John saw this. But Ezekiel had already prophesied. He had already seen it. And so they were all there. The 24 elders. And the four beasts. They fell down and they worshipped God. And they said hallelujah. Amen. We agree. And all of this was about Christ Jesus. Yeah. All of this was about Christ Jesus. And a voice came out of the throne saying, Praise our God, all ye his servants, and ye that fear him, both small and great. The, the 24 elders and the beasts, they were, they were praising God on the work that Christ had accomplished. And I heard as it were the voice of a great multitude and as the voice of many waters and as the voice of mighty thunder saying, Hallelujah, for the Lord God omnip omnipotent reigneth. Let us be glad and rejoice and give honor to him for the marriage of the Lamb is come. Jesus Christ being com coming back. He seen, they saw Jesus coming back to God in his fullness. The marriage of the lamb is come. Jesus Christ, they seeing Jesus as, as a slain lamb that had been to the slaughter. They seeing him on the throne. They seeing Jesus back in his rightful place, married back to his father, to God, being back, Christ being back in his fullness, coming back from the earth, completing the mission that God sent him out to do, to be the fat sacrificial lamb for you and I. 
and his wife have made himself ready. We're his wife. And to her was granted that she should be arrayed in fine linen, clean and white. For the fine linen is the righteousness of saints. We're the saints. And he saith unto me, right. Blessed are they which are called unto the marriage. We are blessed that, our, that, that we are called. Because we're in Christ Jesus. And as long as we're in Christ Jesus and God and Christ is being, he has been reunited back to his rightful place at the right hand of God in the seat of the, in the majesty seat because he is the majesty. We are in him and we are blessed. Hallelujah. 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 Blessed are we who are called unto the marriage supper of the Lamb. And he saith unto me, These are the true sayings of God. And I fell at his feet to worship him. And he said unto me, See thou, do it not. I am thy fellow servant and of thy brethren that have the testimony of Jesus, worship God. For the testimony of Jesus is the spirit of prophecy. Ah, amen, amen, amen. It's the, it's the spirit of prophecy that's in you that allowed you to, to, to be able to testify of Jesus. And I saw heaven open and behold a white horse and he that sat upon him was called faithful and true. That's Jesus, y'all. And in righteousness, he doeth judge and make war. This is Christ. His eyes were as a flame of fire. And on his head were many crowns. Jesus is worthy to wear those crowns. Because he died for you and I. He had a name written. That no man knew. But he himself. And he was clothed with a vesture dipped in blood. And his name is called the word of God. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. The armies which were in heaven followed him. Upon white horses, clothed in fine linen, linen, white and clean. These are the followers of Christ. And out of his mouth goeth a sharp word, a sharp sword, his word. That with it he should smite the nations and he shall rule them with the rod of iron. And he treadeth with wine press. Of the fierceness and wrath of Almighty. He had on his vesture and on his thigh a name written King of Kings and Lord of Lords. And I saw an angel standing in the sun, and he cried with a loud voice, saying to all the fowls. That fly in the midst of the heaven. Come and gather yourselves together. Unto the supper of the great God. That they may eat the flesh of kings. And the flesh of captains. And the flesh of the mighty men. And the flesh of horses. And of them that sit on them. And the flesh of all men. Both free and bond. Both small and great. This was also a prophecy that you'll find in Ezekiel. Ezekiel 39, my Bible says. And the beast was taken. And I saw the beast. The kings of the earth and their armies gathered together to make war against him that sat on the horse and against his army. 
and the beast was taken. And with him, the false prophets that wrought miracles before him, with which he deceived them, that had received the mark of the beast, and them that worship his image, these both were cast alive into a lake of fire, burning with, with brimstone, and the raiment were slain, and the remnant were slain with the sword of him that sat upon the horse, which sword proceeded out of his mouth, and all the fowls were filled with their flesh. This talking about Jesus Christ destroying Satan and how Satan would, de would deceive so many people and he would deceive them to take the mark of the beast and how after Christ would destroy them that the fowl of the air will be able to come and eat of that flesh that Christ had destroyed, the carcasses that would be laying out after Christ destroyed them, that the fowl of the air will be able to come and feast on the wicked those who would follow to try to destroy, to try and denounce the name of Christ and try to remove him off of his throne. That Christ, he defeated Satan. He defeated him and his followers. In 20, the beast was taken and with him the false prophets that wrought miracles before him because there are going to be some false prophet that's going to do miracles that if, if, if you're not careful and you don't have the spirit of God in you, you will believe that this was the, this was the Messiah. And some people are going to do that. And they're going to worship him. But they're going to be destroyed. And the fowl of the air is going to be able to eat the flesh. And they're going to be able to feast God when God destroys Satan. The fowl of the air are going to be able to feast. It's going to, the fowl of the air are going to be, at, be, be at like a smorgasbord, but it's going to be the flesh of those who Christ destroyed. Yes, it's going to be a dreadful day. It's going to be a brutal time. It's going to be a time where, where, where you're going to hear nothing but crying and screaming because Christ is going to defeat Satan and his followers. And I don't want to be a part of that. I want to be, I want to be like, the, John was in the beginning of this. I want to. I want to say hallelujah. And and and, and God's presence it it, it it rose like a smoke. And it was forever. And it was forever. I want to be. I want to be in that part of the verses, where where they were where they were giving God the praise for the mighty works that Jesus had accomplished. Verse 7 in Hebrews, and the angels he saith, who maketh his angels spirits, and his ministers of flame and fire. But unto the Son he saith, Thy throne, O God, is forever and ever. A scepter of righteousness is a scepter of thy kind of thy kingdom. Thou hast loved righteousness and hated iniquity. Therefore, God, even thy God, have anointed thee with the oil of gladness above thy fellows. And thou, Lord, in the beginning has laid the foundation of the earth, and the heavens are the works of thy hands. They shall perish, but thou remainest. Jesus will remain forever. His word will remain forever. And they all shall wax old, as doeth a garment. And as a vesture shall thou fold them up, and they shall be changed. But thou art the same, and thy years shall not fail. But to whom of the angels said he at any time, sit on my right hand until... I make thine enemies thy footstool. Are they not all ministers, ministering spirits, set forth to minister for them 
who shall be heirs of salvation? He asked the question. Are they not all ministers, spirits? Talking about the spirits. Yes, they are. But none of them, even though they are ministering spirits, and the spirits are about a good work because they are doing what God the Father is instructing them to do to come and minister to you and I who are in this tabernacle. God sends those spirits and those spirits come to do the work of God and they minister to us. But not at any time did he say to them, sit on my right hand. He only said that to them. The son. See, God was making a, a clear distinction here that the angels are great, but they're not greater than my son. The angels I am pleased with, but I'm not pleased with them more than my son. The angels obey my voice, but my dear son usurped that when he when he remained on the cross. When he could can't have come down. Jesus Christ could have came down off the cross and he would have not been in trouble. God wouldn't have been mad because he was God. But because of Christ's obedience, he usurped all the angels. And the seat at the right hand is reserved. And was reserved just for him. That's chapter 1 of Hebrews. And again, I could go into these verses. And I could dissect these verses. And pull them apart. But verse, but chapter 1. Is, 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 is just talking about. God being pleased with Jesus and making a clear distinction of how Jesus Christ usurps everything else. That's chapter one of Hebrews and do some of your own research on it when we come back. Because of because because God loved Jesus so much and because of how much God invested into Jesus presence into this earth. In chapter two. The writer opens up and says, Therefore we are to give a more earnest heed to the things which we have heard. At least at any time we should let them slip. Because we know how pleased God is with Christ Jesus. He opened up and said, We are to give a more earnest heed to those things. And so we'll go into verse 2 on next week. If it's the Lord's will. I pray that the word has been a blessing to you. This is the bishop's desk. God bless you all. This is the Bishop's Desk.